Hi everyone. This lecture is going to be about the foundations for visual and performing arts. Um, we have been going over all of the different foundational areas for um, the California Preschool Learning Foundations. And so we are now moving into vol volume two, which is where visual and performing arts live. So I want to talk first um, about something really, really important. So um, this is probably the most underrepresented area, um, I think, along with the social emotional development area. I think most preschool programs and most schools typically tend to focus on skills and behaviors that are related to cognitive development, math and science and reading, language and literacy, all of that, which is all great and really important. And the reason that that's such a focus is because those are skills and behaviors that, um, that children need foundations in for school readiness. And so they call those kind of the fundamental areas. However, I strongly, strongly argue along with a lot of other preschool teachers um, and, and a lot of um, early childhood educators in, in this field really argue the importance of visual and performing arts and how it actually impacts all of those other areas and all of the important reasons of why children need foundations in these areas. But it seems like when we start thinking about school readiness for kindergarten, first grade, so on and so forth, these things kind of fall to the wayside and they're not a main focus of curriculum. And I think that we're doing children a lot of shame in this area and I think we can do a much better job around this and finding ways to incorporate it into our curriculum, especially into the older grades. And so it's one of the reasons that I think a lot of um, preschools don't focus on this too much. They do a little bit of art stuff here and there, and more of what we're seeing done is what we would call product art or crafts. And I'm gonna talk about that today and how we wanna try to move away from those types of things and really look at art, um, visual and performing arts for what they are um, and all of the important beneficial skills that they're gonna build for children. Um, that, that type of um, art and work just isn't going to do. So that is what today's lecture is about. And so again, like I said, I think that this is a really important area, especially because this is the area as well that when we do see it in elementary school programs or even high schools, it's one of the first areas to get cut is art and music classes. So this is one of the many reasons, another one of the many reasons of why this is so vitally important for children to be exposed to in their first five years of life, because the potential, they may not be able to be exposed to some of these areas um, because they're cut in school programs. The other thing is that um, I, I, there's a, a there's a societal approach that these are things that parents should then pay out of pocket, like dance class and things like that. And so, as we know, then a lot of um, our low income families, those children don't have access to these. So again, another reason why it is vitally important that we incorporate these experiences um, and these skills and behaviors into our preschool classrooms. Okay, so let me, oh, how come it's not moving slides? Oh, there we go. Okay, so a little bit um, talking along the lines of what I was just sharing um, is that, and I'm going to move my little screen down here, um, is that learning and development through the arts promotes learning and development in many, many areas, um, including language and literacy, um, especially, you know, the risk taking that is involved in reading um, is, is very much along the lines of risk taking that we would do in performing or um, expressing ourselves through the arts. So, and again, very important piece. And so these visual and performing arts really serve as um, foundations that um, are integrated in the nature of children's learning. And so um, some of the things that we know and we um, 
uh, see happening in connection with these arts is that children are able to um, work on their social skills, right? So working together, having to share space and materials, those, you know, art materials and um, being able to learn about each other through these art mediums and experiences to be involved in those social interactions and relationships that happen in um, art, dance, music, all of that piece. Another part of this is the, the language and vocabulary that is built around, um, you know, um, musical composition and um, the different art mediums and the labeling of different instruments and body awareness and body movements and all of the things that would be in dance. And so there's so many different things um, related to building language that can happen through um, through these visual and performing arts, but also really importantly through uh, through music. And um, so very, very strong connection there as well. So um, children also make connections to their own um, cultural identities and representations through art. When we look at history, um, art, um, the arts is embedded in so many cultures from around the world, um, you know, um, art, famous artists throughout the world. Um, uh, you look at um, different cultures and you can see the representations of their art and certain styles stand out. And so it's really important that there's a, um, a cultural piece to this as well. And of course, music. Music is very, very culturally embedded um, in many of our lives, and it's no different than children. Um, we know that that is a lot of how storytelling has come about over time, is that they put it to music. And so there's a very big, strong cultural root um, in, again, in these varying different art um, forms um, in this foundation. Um, and then, of course, um, there's a lot of psychological benefits to this as well. And so we know that through um, painting, acting, you know, the arts, performing, dance, all of those things um, that um, children as well as adults um, actually express themselves in a therapeutic way. And so um, you'll see this a lot, especially in adults who have like things like PTSD and whatnot, is that um, they'll go through some, um, uh, you know, mental health support. And oftentimes, art is an outlet for a lot of us um, to be able to draw how we're feeling or things that we're thinking about, um, put our ideas on paper, and, um, and really um, express ourselves in these different ways through dance, through music, through, um, you know, movement and the different arts. So um, there's a lot of benefits here um, for children as well as adults, of course. So one of the things that you'll notice about um, the visual and performing arts area um, is that it's laid out a little bit differently than um, all of the other foundations that we have. So just like the other foundations, right, we have that big developmental domain, which is visual and performing arts, and then that is broken down into those strands. So the strands that make up visual and performing arts are visual art, music, drama, and dance. So that is what makes up this area that we call visual and performing arts. Then what you'll notice the change is in the substrand in this particular developmental domain. And what you're going to notice is that um, there are going to be either three or uh, two substrands in some of the different uh, areas. So for visual art, music, and dance, there are three substrands, and they are as follows. 1.0, notice, respond, and engage. 2.0, develop skills. And 3.0, create, invent, and express. For drama, there are two substrands, and those are 1.0, notice, respond, and engage. And then develop skills, uh, 2.0, develop skills to create, invent, 
and express through drama. So they're again, kind of laid out a little bit differently, but inside of these then, the substrands, the foundations that are connected to these are all about being able to have exposure and opportunity. That's really what um, each of these is about. So that's what the first one is about in each of these areas. It's about just being exposed, um, learning about, engaging in, responding to, and noticing different components comp uh, within each of these um, strands. And then develop skills. So again, through once we've had some exposure, then now we can start to develop some skills in being able to, you know, do some of our own um, uh, behaviors that would support um, some of the skills for behavioral, uh, uh, visual art, as well as music, drama, and dance. And then the last one is all about having the opportunity to now apply those express skills. So we're going to actually jump in and look at each one of these a little bit more. So there are four principles. So we're going to look at visual art first. There are four principles um, and they are as follows. Um, the first principle is all about children being able to express their feelings, ideas, interests, um, stories, moods, everything that you could possibly think of through art. It's really important um, and this, that this also includes children with special needs um, who may have um, some social emotional um, uh, issues. There are a lot of benefits there with that and being able to just, again, express themselves through the art. Um, this includes it as a nonverbal aspect. So um, especially targeting children who are English, English language learners or children who are still just developing English and it's harder for them to communicate or express through um, through words in a, in a verbal way, they're able to express themselves through making or creating, um, uh, you know, pictures and drawings and so on and so forth. Um, children also grow in their abilities and start to show more interest in different art media, um, such as, you know, and, and we're going to talk a lot about that. I'm going to show a lot of, um, images of this, but it's really important that we have a variety of art media that children are exposed to. And so it has to go beyond crayons, paint, construction paper, clay. Um, we want them trying things like oil pastels and um, being able to use a variety of different textures and tools that um, artists also use, being able to see what it feels like, not just to paint or color on construction paper, but what does it feel like to paint and put my paintbrush to canvas and what does that feel like it's textured differently and um so the you know um that's really important that we can expose them to all of the tools but also the different art media that um is used in visual art it also one of the other underlining principles is that it gives children the opportunity to share their opinions and their thoughts um, about others, but their own work. So this is also a really important piece is that it's really important for children to be able to express um, what they have done and created and that they do it in a positive way. And we're going to talk a lot about how um, uh, and this is where the um, product versus process art comes in, um, but also how we're responding to children's artwork is really important as well, um, but also um, their opinions and responses to other people's artwork. And you're going to see me talk about this um, when we talk about exploring artists and doing artist studies. Um, so it's important to, um, to be reflective of artwork as well. And then also with, related to this as well is then the displaying of art is also really important. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then last is about um, 
just children's progress in their own abilities um, to make more detailed or more realistic representations. So this is a really key piece. And again, um, this also gets touched on and talked about when we talk about the difference between product versus process art. And so it's really important that um, that children have realistic representations and that um, that, that is what they're viewing and, and we're striving for, um, is that paying attention to detail and, and um, going back and revisiting their work. That's actually another important piece as well. So let me move our slide here. So on the next two slides, I have um, just some images. This one is about basic scribbles, um, just kind of showing the progression of scribbling over time um, and how um, these are actually really important pieces to art, but also emergent writing um, is again using having that coordination with their um, fingers, but also wrist is really important. Um, and uh, just so how we can see some of the progressions of when they're making lines and then when things start to get more curvy and have more fluid movement to them um, and how um, the scribbling and the circular lines are also really important and how then we start to get to a more controlled um, focus of our scribbles. Um, which then starts to lead into the stages of pictorial drawings. And so you'll see um, these images here are what are represented down here at the bottom and how then um, these progressions make their way and move all the way to more detailed um, pictorial drawings and representations and how detail is an important part. Um, of drawing, but also art. Um, and again, the more a child is having that exposure to add in detail, um, then the better the representation is for them. Now, one of the things I wanna talk about is the use of food in art. So this is a really important piece that we discuss and a lot of changes there is, is happening in this area. So, um, you know, a long time ago, this was acceptable. Um, growing up, I did things um, in art, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in the classroom, you know, gluing of noodles or whatnot on, um, you know, on paper, we colored them or paint them. Um, but it's really important that we look at this um, in a diversity aspect. We have to remember a couple of things with food and the use of food in classrooms today. So first, let me talk about the allergy piece. So that is a general statement related to the use of food in classrooms. And that includes in appropriate ways, um, appropriate use of food, which is serving a food for meals and snacks, but also um, cooking experiences. Um, and we'll talk about that with science a lot. Here's the thing. I want you to know where where uh, that is developmentally and why it's important, which is why I'm going to talk about it a lot in science. But what we have to remember is that we are in today's world. And today's world is that we have a lot of things going on. And one of the number one things is more uh, food allergies. Food allergies are really, really common. You most likely are going to have at least one food allergy um, in your classroom, if not more. So with that being said, that is one of the number one reasons that we do not use food for other purposes other than eating um, is because we may have severe uh, food or allergic reactions to food items or items that are inside food. And so we don't want to be um, limiting children um, in this area, if you're using food for art or putting it out as an activity, we have to be very, very careful because of severe food allergies. So that's the number one. Um, number two is this cultural piece. We have to remember that we are currently in a time where within most communities, especially our community in the Central Valley, is that majority of our families are, and children are what we call food insecure. That means that they are not having access, adequate access to food and nutrition. And so again, 
one of our roles is that this is a piece for us. We have to be able to recognize this and the use of the inappropriate use of food being used in art is not being culturally sensitive. It is not being sensitive to those families where food is expensive. It is also valuable. You have to remember that within a lot of cultures throughout the world, food is meant as a form of nutrition. And that really is what the intended purpose of food is. It should not be used in art and in a creative way of expression. And again, for cultural, re um, cultural but also um, religious reasons. So in the last, I would say probably 15, 20 years, uh, we have really been looking at this as an anti -bias, part of anti-bias curriculum in that we want to be culturally and, um, uh, you know, uh, respectful to all of the families and children in our programs. And yes, it may vary year to year, but it is really important that we look at um, food as what its intended purpose, and that is for nutrition and nurturing and, um, you know, our bodies and all of the functions. And then we look at art as something that is um, used through art materials and media for self-expression rather than um, using food as an art medium. Um, so really important there. Um, that we are being really careful with the use of food in art. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about product art versus process art. So, um, and I just realized that I should have flip-flopped this down here, but anyway, so, okay. So again, um, Growing up, most of us, when, when we think of art and what we were exposed to as children in, is what we would call product art. Another way to look at product art is crafts or crafting. And while this is okay, um, and there can be some skills and behaviors that are beneficial in this area, I want you to try to um, let go of those images in your mind and try to move toward what we would call process art. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the two differences between the two, and then we're gonna look at some examples. So process art is all about allowing the children to explore how to do something. So it's all about exploration. It's for them to figure out how to use those mediums and those art materials and what they can do with them. So it should be more open-ended. Product art tells children that there's only one way to do or use something, and that's not true. So I, I, for a lot of things in life, right, there is not just one way to do something, and there's not a right way to do something. So I think it's important that children see art in this way, is that it's for them to figure out and for them to explore and um, see what they're able to do. Um, Another uh, component to pro uh, process art is that it sets the expectation, children set the expectation themselves. And so again, because they are who they are, they are individual, their art should be individual. It shouldn't all look the same, which is what is very common in product art. And so in product art, um, it sets children to standards that are set by adults, is that oh, we're making um, a leprechaun today and this is what it's supposed to look like and this is where you have to put the legs and this is where this goes and this is what color this is supposed to be, is those are standards that are being set by the adult and not the child. And so art really should be, again, if we're looking at it for what it is, is a form of self-expression. And that means that it should be individual because each child is individual. So they should be setting those expectations for themselves, like when their stuff is done or what it needs. It shouldn't be dictated and told to by adults. So again, process art is something that would be what we call open-ended. And product art is more closed-ended. It has an outcome, a product at the end. Process art is all about just the process of using the materials, 
being exposed to the materials and being able to express something themselves. And that's a process and that doesn't happen overnight. In process art, there is no expectation. So again, there's no outcome. It's about the process and about what they are creating and how they want it and when they want it to be finished rather than product art has this expectation that there's an end outcome or a product. Process art also has a positive impact on the child's self-esteem. So again, it's because it's their representation, their, 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 their own expectation of what they're making, what they're doing. And so that, that is such a powerful, um, empowering thing for a young child, but also in, in the development of their self-esteem and seeing themselves and their work and what they can do in a positive way. So if you think back to social emotional and some of those, um, the strands for self and self-awareness, it was all about self-esteem and seeing themselves and what they can do and make in a positive way. When we are exposing children to that product art that has adult standards and expectations connected to them and that outcome, if it doesn't, if what they made didn't look like the expectation, that lowers and impacts a child's self-esteem. And so product art actually has negative impacts on children's self-esteem. So again, another one of the reasons why we want to try to move away from product art and these types of experiences. And of course, lastly, process art is completely and wholeheartedly child-centered as it should be individual to each individual child and and with them at the center of it them at the whole reason for even doing it and that's being child centered whereas product art it typically is the adult it's adult centered the adult found the craft um you know idea or whatever on pinterest and they picked it out because it's going with some kind of theme or something in the classroom that's being explored and so it's adult centered. The adult has the outcome or the expectation why they're doing it and what they're doing. And so we have to be really careful with this um, in uh, preschool classrooms for sure. So I'm going to show you understand the difference between the two. So the image on the left is what we would call process art. And the one over here on the right would be an example of product art. Um, so again, this is all about children having the freedom of expression to explore the art materials and mediums, colors, and choose what they want to do with it and where they want to put it on the paper rather than having to follow um, you know, some cute little um, format that um, an adult came up with uh, to represent these umbrellas. So this would be another example. Um, the one on the left here is what we would call process. So again, children using different types of tools, um, art medium, colors, um, and exploring how the colors move and bleed and what happens when I use this tool to roll it out. Um, now the colors are getting smushed and blended together. Um, that is part of art, that individual expression and exploration. On the right here, we have what we would call product art. So this is a whole bunch of penguins. They all look identical and the same. And I don't know about you, but that is not what our classrooms look like. Our classrooms are filled with children who are unique. They are their own unique individual beings. They have their own ideas and thoughts and express expressions and wants of how they see or want to see or create something. And so again, this is an adult centered experience. This is a child centered experience. So this is another example of process versus 
product art. Again, there is a outcome or a product. And again, you can see this is more of what we would call a craft. Um, and so this is not a realistic representation of an apple, the inside of an apple or an apple core. It's a craft. And so um, again, we want to give children as much exposure to real life, realistic representations. So if you want to do something with apples, then you should have a real apple right there in front of the children, cut it open and be looking and exploring the center of the apple and that apple core and what those seeds actually look like because it looks nothing like this. Remember that our job is to be helping children answer their questions and explore the world around them. And this is not teaching them anything at all about apples. It doesn't teach them about their smell, their taste, the different colors, nothing. So again, moving away from this idea of crafts and um, cutesy art, um, with a product over a process. And so this is um, children using different types of um, the paint and then using acid from the lemons to squeeze on there and see what chemical reaction happens and what it does to this art medium and how it actually changes their painting um, and lets them um, use that um, acid and that lemon in a different way. So again, um, this would be an example of that piece there. So I am so sorry, but I am going to have to move this because I'm running out of battery while I'm recording this and we're going to lose. So I'm going to plug in. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm going to have to move you here and plug in. Here. Real life, this is what happens. Okay, all right, we're back. Okay, so we finished talking about the difference between process art and product art. Okay, so now I want to show you guys some great representation of visual art and what visual art should look like. So again, um, visual art should be something that teaches children about art and the, the tools associated with art, the vocabulary associated with art, um, the medium associated with art. So we should be teaching children about these concepts and look at this great vocabulary. So again, you know, uh, language and literacy, right? Learning some vocabulary as well. It, vocabulary is connected in art. So you've got line, shape, color, value, texture, form, space. Those are all different um, vocabulary related to art, different art materials and medium and that it should be a form of expression. It should be joyous. They should be communicating something through art and it should be collaborative as well. So let's take a piece, um, uh, take a look at a couple of representations here. So one of the first things I wanna talk about is setting up your art studio or art area display in your classrooms. So one of the things that's really important is that you should have variety, but it also should be thoughtfully displayed and organized so that children can find the materials that they need and have them ready and available right then and there in front of them. So one of the things, of course, is color. Color is such an important part um, to art. And it's important that children understand color and that color has shades. It comes in varying hues, another great vocabulary word, and that they can be able to see color separated from each other so that when they are having a feeling or a way that they wanna express something that they're either feeling inside or that they're visually trying to represent, that they can come over and see each individual color as it stands individually, but then also get to figure out how to blend, mix, 
um, you know, those different colors to get the right color. That's all part of what art is about, is being able to blend and mix and mesh and, and find the right um, representation. And so children should have a variety of art materials to do that. So going beyond thinking about just crayons and markers and colored pencils. So um, giving them opportunity to try out things like oil pastels, um, different types of um, uh, you know, brushes and um, different types of paint. So watercolor, tempura paint, um, and, you know, what happens if you add water and, and um, you know, thin it out, how it looks differently and paints differently. Um, so art and science are also very closely related, um, very important piece. So these are some great representations of art studios that are um, really nicely organized and displayed so that children can be really thoughtful about the choices that they want to make and what they want to use. Another piece that's really important in setting up your art studios is that you should have literature. Yes, books about art, um, art forms, artists, so I'll talk about that in another slide, um, should all be displayed in your art area. And then another thing that I want to talk about is the displaying of actual artwork. So you'll see in these two images here, um, that we have art displayed on the walls. And the difference here that you'll notice compared to some of those other images that we saw earlier is that it all looks different because different children made them and have a different view on what they're seeing. They see the world through their lenses. So none of us see the world the same way. Why should our art look the same way? So it's really important that we display children's artwork um, for them to look at and see themselves and what they created in a positive way, but also so that they can talk about it with other children, be able to show people what they did, what they made, and what they wanted to tell us about it. And so that means that underneath is that we should be including children's words. It's so important with art that we listen to children and let them tell their story and tell, you know, us about their work. So when children come to you and they show you their work, it's really important that you respond in a way that empowers the child. It is not about you liking the artwork. It's about them liking their work. So when they come and they're so excited and they're like, look, teacher, look what I made. It's so important that you do not respond with things like, oh, I love it. It's beautiful. You're putting your thoughts and feelings and expectation on their work. And that again, impacts their self-esteem. Instead, what you should say is, oh, wow, I can see how hard you worked on this. You used so many different things. Can you tell me about it? And then give them the opportunity to share their work with you rather than it just being this quick passive response of, oh, I like it. It's beautiful. And then you come up to, you say that to every child. What message does that send to that child? So it's important that you let them tell you about their work. Um, ask them about what they made, write their words down, document what they're saying and what they did and what their thoughts and their feelings and their ideas were. So, so important. And then I always ask the child, do you like what you made? Is it complete? Are you finished? Do you need anything else? Do you want to work on it again tomorrow? So those are all really important things that you want to respond to when a child um, or a way to respond to a child when they come to share their artwork. Okay, so some other components to art here. Three-dimensional art. So a lot of times most of us are exposed to and what we think about is two-dimensional art and that's just painting on paper and that type of stuff and that is so valuable and very important but it's also important that children learn about three-dimensional art because the world around them is three-dimensional. It is not flat. And so items and materials 
are three dimensional. And so it's important that children start to learn to see objects in their true three dimensional form. And so it's important that they have exposure to three dimensional art. And you can do this through wood, clay, rocks, um, you know, all different types of things, anything that is three dimensional. So give children these items and allow them to create three, three dimensional representations. Because again, this is them trying to learn how to represent objects and materials that they see throughout uh, in, in, in the world around them. And so also incorporating books you know, about sculptures and how things are built. Um, because again, the world is not flat, it's not two dimensional. And so it's important that they can see things from different perspectives, different angles, um, move around. So that's another important part is that you, as an artist, you should not be just sitting there, you should move around and look at things from other angles and um, try to represent them from different ways. And we're gonna talk about that, I think next in, no, nope, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, I was gonna, we're gonna talk about uh, still life and um, th these three dimensional drawings. So another part of art is that it should be collaborative. It should not just be individual, but that we learn how to express ourselves in a collaborative way around collaborative pieces of work. So one of the most important skills and behaviors that we have to learn and throughout our entire lives is that we are not by ourselves. We are not, um, yes, we have individual components to ourselves, but we have to learn how to work around shared use of materials and space and projects. So just like you guys are doing in our class where you have group projects, you are going to, for the rest of your lives, have to work with others and learn how to work with others and share materials and share your space where you live, um, when you're in classrooms together, but jobs, offices, all of those types of things. And so art is a very social, it can be a very social experience. And so creating collaborative artworks where children come together and they each contribute what they want to um, to the piece of art and then talk as a group about when it's done or when we feel like we are finished or do people want to continue working on it. And so it's important and it's a great way to see the voice in your classroom and the, the, the classroom community that is that particular group. And so it, again, will never look the same. You can do this same thing and every time it's going to look different. That's what process art is. That's what's so wonderful about it is that it will never ever um, be duplicated or the same. It will always be individual and different. Um, and so again, giving children those opportunities and you can see that these are different um, materials, different textures that they were painting on here, um, on the canvas here using squeeze bottles this time. This time they're using their um, paint brushes. Um, it looks like uh, paint and hands and all kinds of stuff went into this one as well. So art being very collaborative. So, Another great way to approach art is what we call provocations. And very simply put, provocations means to provoke. Um, provoking ideas, thoughts, discussions, questions, interests, creativity, ideas. That is what something should do in your classroom. And so you really should look at all of your setup in your classroom as provocations, as something that is going to provoke or engage a sense of wonder and creativity in the children in everything, every area of your classroom. And so it's important that we do this as well with art and that we set up our art areas very, or our experiences very intentionally. And so this one right here has two examples. And then it says, can you make a picture or design with dots, just using dots. And so they've got a couple of examples right here. And so again, it's a, it's a, um, a pro what we call a provocation. And so it's another way to approach art. Um, you see right here, 
this one is set up where it, it's kind of cut off. Um, I'm going to show you some more examples of this, but again, it's asking a question. Um, it looks like some type of gourd or something was set up, displayed right here, and then children are um, having provocations about this um, item and then trying to represent that realistic representation um, open-endedly the way that they see it um, and are visualizing um, and how they want to express. Uh, this image over here, I love this because again, what we know is that color comes in all different uh, variations, hues, different shades. And so I love this here um, where they have the different hues um, and shades of blue and um, the children can create and make um, using uh, the different shades of just blues. Um, so I thought that was a really great representation, another way to put out an art activity um, and make it different and unique. So again, provocations can come in many forms. Um, it can be an interesting photo, a picture, a book. It can be um, items or specimens from nature, right? That is one of the easiest things to do is look around what you have in your environment around you and you can set it up in a way that is going to potentially provoke questions, thoughts, discussions, creativity, so on and so forth. Um, and so look outside, grab a branch. Um, I, I love this image back here. This is just a fallen branch from a tree and the children are painting it, they're adding things to it. So again, um, it's their creative uh, you know, expression, um, finding old materials or items to display and use in a new way. Um, anything that is going to provoke the interest of the children. So that is how I want you to think of art is in terms of something that is to elicit provocations. So artists and still life. So I kind of touched on this and that's kind of what we saw here in this image, but this is another great way and of these provocations is to do it around an artist and do artist studies, but also that you create what we call still life. So still lifes are just items or objects, again, found in the world, and they are displayed in the center. And then children have the opportunity to do what we call representational drawings or still life drawings. And so this is great for both art, but also I do this a lot in science, in the science area. When I lecture on science, we'll talk about that and I'll show you some of those. Um, but you can see that these um, are just some bugs, um, some insects from a, that they have as materials in the classroom. The teacher thoughtfully displayed them in a still life form at the center of the table. And then the children can come and use the pencils um, to represent and try to draw and recreate representations of these insects and all of their different parts and the details that are in them. So same thing here. This is just some sunflowers that the teacher brought in. And what I love about this is that the teacher also included Van Gogh's famous painting of sunflowers right here. And so again, incorporating connections to our artists and history is so important. And so art becomes a historical form that we can communicate history through. And um, same as music but and dance, but um, art is a great way to do that. And so there's a lots of different children's books that talk about the different artists. Um, different famous artists, and so reading those books to them, but then also exposing them to, um, and here's another image of Van Gogh, one of Van Gogh's famous paintings, and again, another way to represent this painting. So rather than it being done in paint, they have items here, their little glass, um, those little glass stones and beads in all different colors, and the children had the opportunity to come and try to recreate and represent this painting, but using a different form, different form of expression, different material. Um, and then again, here's another um, display of uh, sunflowers. I love this because this is a real sunflower head and um, it's hard to see in the picture, but you can see up close that the actual seeds are inside there. And then these children are um, painting and doing um, 
representations of this still life display, but then also um, trying to recreate and represent that, that real sunflower. Okay, so um, I think that was all I wanted to say about art. I'm hoping you guys learned actually a lot about visual art and how important it is. And I hope that you can see the value in some of these other ways of, um, of, of visual art, rather than it just being, you know, easel painting where you throw out um, some paint and some brushes. It should be so much more important and deeper than that and very important that um, we expose children to everything that we possibly can. So now let's talk a little bit about music. Music is also another really big subject and an area um, where children can be creative in their expression of music, but then also their expression of just hearing music, but also creating and making music. So um, research shows that children typically develop musical skills and concepts in a predictable sequence. All young children, um, including children with special needs, acquire musical understanding and communication skills. They progress developmentally from active hands-on experiences to meaningful uh, uh, pictorial representation, sorry, <laughs> and finally, um, symbolic representation to sound ideas. I love that quote, and so um, I wanted to include it here, but um, with music, we have auditory skills, um, vocal skills and abilities. They get to learn how to see what their voice can do. Their voice is an instrument. So that includes not just musical instruments, but singing, and this is an instrument, and how to use it, how to control it, the different volumes, all of those types of things um, are really important part to music and song. Song acquisition, movement and rhythmic skills, and body movement, body awareness, and how our body moves in representation with sound. Um, and then of course, exploration of musical instruments and their sounds, but then also the creativity of getting to express through those musical instruments and create music. And then of course, just listening. Sometimes we just want to listen to music and let it move or, or um, fill us with a story or an idea or a feeling or an expression. So um, with that being said, music is very open-ended just like art. It should be um, where children are being exposed to different um, types of music, different types of musical instruments. Um, but then also getting the opportunity to use them, see how to use them, and how to create those sounds themselves, but also in non-traditional types of instruments. So it's important, and again, thinking about vocabulary and language and literacy, it's important that we talk to children about different types of musical instruments and different types of music and the vocabulary that it is connected to. I love this image because these are not typical musical instruments that you would talk about on a regular basis, like a kazoo, an accordion, a mandolin, a jug. So very important um, and big vocabulary. So great um, um, exposure there as well. You want to try to give children an opportunity to really be exposed to the real musical instrument if possible. Um, so when looking at children's instruments, um, looking for sets that are realistic, that are wooden, not plastic, um, that would have been how, oops, how those instruments were constructed and made um, when they originally were developed is important. Also having instruments from a variety of cultures from around the world is also really important. And then that includes in types of music that you have lots of different types of music and cultural representations of different musical um, uh, creations from around the world. And then my favorite 
different are music goal gardens. These are examples of music walls or music gardens um, that they're sometimes called. And so you can do these both indoors or outdoors. You can create um, musical walls by hanging a variety of different types of objects where children can explore the sounds and um, the different sounds that they make. And so this is a lot of fun, especially because a lot of teachers tend to shy away from musical experiences because it can get loud. Children can get a little bit out of control with this and a little bit loud. But when you have good classroom management, then this isn't a problem and you do it in an appropriate way so that children, so that it will get loud. So that is one of the things that um, I suggest is that if you're gonna do whole group um, experiences that you try to do them outdoor because children will, it will get really, really loud. <laughs> um, and so having these walls outside and doing whole group musical things outside where you take your, um, your instruments out in a basket or a box or whatever and go outside and do music out there um, that can be a lot better. You also have to be careful with it getting a little too loud for children who may have some sensory um, issues around sound and um, and you know, you want to be respectful of that. And so um, again, going outside where the sound can travel and carry a little bit better um, might be a great um, approach. Um, the other way that I really suggest is that um, you do this in small groups. And so this would be an activity that's set up in your classroom for four to five kids, sometimes even less than that. And then it can be sort of more of a station or something that's available every day that week so that everybody has the opportunity to come over um, and it not being done as that big, large group, which again can sometimes get way out of hand and too loud. So um, a part of music is not just about exploring the instruments and the sound, but also how our body moves with music, how to use our bodies with music, um, and then um, and then singing and our voice being a musical instrument as well. So it is important that we do gather children when we try to sing songs with them, um, but also, again, have that opportunity where um, they are getting to actually use and try out these musical instruments. And so um, singing songs or doing some of these fun types of things about how the music relates to our bodies, very important. And then any opportunity that you can have somebody come in and actually sing to children or play music to children is really important. Don't just rely on CDs. Um, and exposing children to the different types of music that way. So I always would ask, um, notes always went out, and I would ask families, does anybody um, sing or play a musical instrument? Would you be willing to come in and do a performance, actually bring in the real guitar um, so children can see, see it? Um, feel what how heavy it is, the size that it is, and how to actually use it. So any opportunity, again, that you can have the real representation, the better, um, and then incorporate guests or people to come in. Um, or if you yourself are musically inclined, I am not, so I always had to rely on um, others. But if you yourself are talented in this area and feel comfortable um, you know, um, playing in front of children or whatnot. Now, obviously not all of us are talented vocally, but it is important that even with that, that we as the lead teacher in our classroom and the assistant teachers, that we are still singing with children, even if our voice isn't good. Um, children don't care. They have no idea. They just think it's fun and they themselves are learning how to develop this. So it's important that they see it as a risk that is worth taking and that it's okay to take that risk, even if it maybe didn't come out the way you wanted it to. Um, that's okay. That's what they're trying to figure out. So um, it's important that we also learn how to do that ourselves. Another area um, within visual and performing arts is drama. Okay. So this is, of course, an area that most of us are familiar with is having that imaginary play and dramatic play in our classrooms or the pretend play. Um, many of you that have your own children or nieces or nephews or family members, you have saw, probably seen this a lot. We know that this is pretend play. Children do this all the time. It is one of the typical um, stages of play and um, children and 
are doing exactly that, which what pretend play is again, them trying to represent and recreate the world around them. So again, the arts is one of the ways that we do that. So we do that through visual art. We can do that through music. We can do it through dance, but we also can do it through drama. And drama is the retelling of stories oftentimes. That's what drama is or dramatic um, um, you know, theater. And back in the day, before there were TVs and computers and all of those things, this is what people did. They told stories through realistic retellings, through storytelling, but then put uh, that storytelling to um, a realistic representation of it or a play. And that is how people um, you know, spent their time. They didn't have anything else to do. So they spent their time singing, dancing, playing musical instruments, retelling stories, and retelling them through dramatic expression. And so really what this is, is it's, it's movies. It, we now have a recorded form and a way to um, record these representations with set designs and costumes and all of those things. It's the movies, you guys. So that is what drama is. So it's important that children understand that and they are exposed to it, but that they're exposed to it in a way that is developmentally appropriate. So turning on and playing a movie for children in your classroom is not developmentally appropriate way to do this. So what you do is talk to children about the history of drama and storytelling and this um, pretend um, play and share with them all of that and children get that opportunity where they get to be those characters and be the representation and have items or objects represent certain things to be able to retell their story. Um, so that is sort of the main idea behind this. Um, it sh sometimes should be spontaneous. Other times it can be planned out and thought through, rehearsed. So um, lots of different ways to approach this. So drama. So again, it is the retelling of stories. And so I think it's important that we talk to children and expose them to words like theater and talk about the history of drama, um, read books about these types of things and talk about concepts of going to performances or shows and how there are certain rules that you have to follow. You have to be quiet. You have to wait to be seated. Um, there's going to be an intermission. All of those types of things are concepts and part of this drama related um, to this and that there's different types of shows we go to. Some are musical shows. Some are artistic shows where you go and observe paintings and there's an art show where it's displayed of art. That's also another great thing you can do in your classroom is hold an art show and invite parents and they can come and see all of their work. Same thing here, you can do puppet shows um, and actually act out and do some theater, some drama. So have a story and then have children create the set design and the costumes, plan them out, um, have roles and learn how to do that and have parts and take turns. So there's so many developmental things happening in drama and that children can learn from this dramatic piece and dramatic play. Um, so these are just some more images of um, dramatic play happening. So this is more of going the theater route where you're exploring the concepts of um, live live storytelling. Um, this is more of your typical everyday kind of dramatic play happening in your classroom where you're going to set up your classroom to be a firefighter area or you're going to turn it into, you know, a bakery or um, a doctor, a veterinarian, a grocery store, a farmer's market, all of those types of things. So many different endless opportunities. Um, 
and I kind of liked this one. I had never seen this before, but um, they decided to turn their dramatic play into something called the Beach Cafe. And I love this because again, books incorporated in every area of the classroom is so important. And so they've displayed some books related to um, the ocean that they've read, I'm sure at group or circle times. Um, so the Rainbow Fish, and then this is an Eric Carle book. I can't remember what it's called, but it has to do with a hermit crab. Um, and so a few other books here, I'm not familiar with those, but then they took a bunch of items um, that they found that are represented in these different books and the children can um, play and dramatize and act out um, some of these different stories. Um, so I love that. Um, and again, just changing the novelty of changing this out, changing your materials is what's gonna get children in there and engaged and again, provoke them to um, ask questions and discussions and all of that. One of the other things that I want to say is, again, I'm always going to be an advocate that it, in, that you should always try to have the real items, the real objects and real representations for children in everything that we do. And so um, while this is very cute and everything, um, it what would be even better is instead of children's costumes, you have the real items, you can bring in the real thing. Um, of course, you can't always do that and it's not always appropriate. But I love these three images right here in setting up a dramatic play area that is a realistic representation. So dramatic play should really bring in and connect home life, um, the use of these real objects. And so I love this. This is a real telephone, um, real table um, items and, and a real representation, these chairs, um, rather than the plastic bright colored um, you know, representations. If you see right here, these are actual real blow dryers that have had the cords cut off of them and um, other items there. So again, things that children want to explore in their homes, but oftentimes are not allowed to, because yeah, it wouldn't be appropriate for them to go and, um, you know, use, um, you know, a real blow dryer because it could be dangerous, it's plugged in, but you have a broken one, make it appropriate for children to use in the classroom and how great for them to actually explore what it's like. So a real clock, a real phone, I uh, again, love it. Um, real representations. Um, this is a um, dramatic play area that was turned into a construction zone. And so some real hammers and real items here. And again, this would be an area that would probably um, not be freely opened. It would have to be opened with adult uh, supervision and support to be able to help them in using some of these real items, but actually pulling out real pieces of wood and do real woodworking. Um, I've done that before in my classroom and kids love it. They love to glue real wood together, um, be able to use the hammers and try out some of the different things connected to that. Also a great way to incorporate um, a parent who might be um, in this profession, you could pull them in and ask them to share some of these items and what they're called. Yeah, you could probably do that too, but how great if you could incorporate something like that. And then I love this one. They turned this dramatic play area um, and they set it up as like a picnic. So it's got like a little, it's more of like a picnic type table with the little umbrella and you see the picnic basket here. And so I just love that it's something that's different. But again, when you set the environment up in these realistic type ways with realistic items, it's going to have, again, this is a provocation. So it's gonna provoke a sense of wonder, interest, creativity, questions, discussions, ideas, and that is how you move your curriculum from one thing to the next is based off of those children's interests that happen from these provocations. Okay, so that was drama. And then last is dance. So we are born to move. That is how our body naturally unfolds. We are meant to be 
um, moving, um, to use our body for movement, for purposes of moving from one place to another. And so dance is, and movement is an inherited natural part of our, of who we are as human beings and how we were developed. So it is really important that we have, um, that, that children learn about formal dance, but also informal dance, and that is just connected to how we want to respond to music and movement, um, how our body responds and uses our bodies in an appropriate way. So research suggests that formal dance instruction in early childhood has many potential benefits, such as increasing self-esteem, enhancing motor awareness and control of heightened coordination to improve balance and confidence in movement. So dance, again, very important. Unfortunately, like I said earlier at the beginning of this PowerPoint, this is one of the areas that oftentimes we don't do a lot with in our programs. We do a little bit, but then parents are faced with having to shell out a lot of money to take dance classes and it can be really expensive and a lot of families can't afford this. So it's important that we try our best as teachers. We don't have to be experts in dance, but you could do some of those basic things and expose children to different forms of dance, different types of dance, and look at all of the great potential benefits that come with um, being able to learn about our bodies, how our bodies move. And so, um, again, it is another area that we can also express ourselves in an expressive, creative, individual way um, when we can't do it through words. And so <clears throat> it's all about children being exposed to dance movements, understanding vocabulary associated with dance, um, and uh, being able to create these experiences, develop some of the, temp um, the uh, typical pieces of dance. So um, being aware of other people in dance and that sometimes we, dances are meant to be done together and other times dances are, can be individual, um, how we move through space, but then also that we're responding to timing and tempo and things like that with dance, um, but then also that we can create and invent our own dance, dances and express ourselves through movement. So um, lots of different ways that we can do dance in our classroom, but of course, um, just putting on music and letting children dance and dance freely. There's some dance um, movement CDs, excuse me, and songs out there that go through movements and children do them. Other times you can just put music on and let kids move how they want. You can incorporate the use of materials such as scarves, or rib ribbons, um, also them putting on their costumes and then those are uh, the dramatic play clothing and come out and dance in them as well. Um, Cause that is part of performing and the musical piece there. Um, also doing it outside. Don't forget all of these areas you can do outside. So important to get children outside and dancing and moving um, both indoors and outdoors. Another piece of this is understanding our body and how it moves and being aware of our movements and our body. We'll talk a little bit about this because it also falls under physical development, um, is body awareness, awareness of our body parts, um, but how they work and move. So that is also an important part to dance. And so one of the greatest things that you can do very easy is to do yoga in your classroom and again it is connected to this piece as well and so um, I'll talk about this a little bit more like I said with physical development but there's great yoga CDs music books um, things like that um, lots of different ways that you can use yoga and the body movements in your classroom and it's all about de um, children developing a positive body image as well and how their body works and how it moves and so it's important that they explore that. That's a lot of the reason that they don't like to sit during those half an hour long um, group, uh, you know, circle times is because their body needs to move 
more often than 30 minutes. So they have to move a lot. So another one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of those long circle times is it's an unrealistic expectation for them to not move their bodies. So if you're going to have a large group gathering, it needs to be something that children are allowed to move or have opportunities to move during that group gathering and that you're never, um, uh, limiting a child from movement. I don't know about you, but I can't sit very long. I have to move my body as well. You know, tap our feet, those kinds of things shift our bodies. Why wouldn't we think that children need to do that too? So to ask them to stay still, still and sit on their little square at circle time is so unrealistic. They're going to need to shift and move their body and they should feel free to do so. And so you should create a climate and an environment that allows them to do that naturally. So that would be a little bit about dance and the part of dance that includes movement and understanding our body. And I think that is the end of the um, presentation. So I hope you guys learned, um, you know, a lot about the visual and performing arts and everything that it includes. Um, it's a very big area. And like I said, a very underrepresented area in our classrooms. But I really do believe that it is, at, in essence, really the heart of an early childhood education classroom should incorporate the arts and have experiences and opportunities for these things. So um, anyway, we will talk a little bit more in class. I hope this gave you guys some ideas for your upcoming lesson plans. And um, yeah, uh, happy exploring visual and performing arts. Bye guys.